I am Boris. And I am Natasha. And, and we're we are stronger, stronger together. together. All right, we're kind of goofballs tonight. Welcome to our second podcast of Stronger Together. We're so amazed at the outreach that our first podcast had, and we hope that you'll continue to support us as we talk about rebuilding lives after grief. Our scripture for this episode is Job 14.7. At least there is hope for a tree. If it is cut down, it will sprout again, and its new shoots will not fail. We grow. When something happens in life that cuts us down and leaves just a stub, we grow. And sometimes we grow in different ways. We become basically a different person. I know for me, God had to, he had to hew me down to the, down to the root. He'd take it all. And he just, we're going to, it's a do-over. we we'll start all over again. It was really scary. But we made it. So today we're talking about growing in grief. We'll be comparing it to a garden because that's what resonates with both of us. Uh, if you watch the photos that we're going to put on with this podcast, you'll see many beautiful blooming gardens. So please take a look at the pictures and let them lift you up because nature has a way to connect us to our creator. So for me, solitude was an important part of my grief processing. I'd walk outside in nature daily to reflect on what had happened to my world. I needed to understand how to move forward in my life now that I was suddenly alone. Every part of my marriage was a partnership, every part, and now I had to navigate life without that balance. I'm fond of saying, and you can ask anybody who knows me, a man needs a strong woman or he will blow himself up. They are what keep us grounded, sane, whole, and it's very important. So then I was trying to figure out what was God's plan now. Uh, I had no intention of dating or remarrying because I knew that no one would be able to fill that gap. Uh, And I really wrestled with the idea of being married in heaven because the Bible says we're not. And I don't typically argue with God. I may give him an eyebrow. That one I argued with him about four weeks. And uh, I, I had to, I just had to come to understand why we're not married in heaven. And Once I got there, once I realized that the love we'll have for one another is stronger than anything we can have for an individual here, that kind of reconciled that for me, and that that became my stepping stone over that one. The scriptures teach us that marriage is for time here on earth only, that the love we will have for each other in heaven will surpass anything we know here. So I was in a marriage um, in a religion that taught that marriage was for time and all eternity. So if I left that relationship, not only would I lose my spouse, but I would be destroying the relationship I had with my children and grandchildren and successive generations as the marriage covenant was seen as a ceiling through time and eternity. So it, was a, it wasn't an easy decision to leave. I had to come to the realization that I was in an abusive relationship, which took a long time for me to grasp. Number one, nobody wants to admit they're being abused. Number two, it was, it was a little blurry because it would be good for a couple of weeks and I would talk myself into I had been imagining things and then it would get really bad. The abuse was emotional, spiritual, financial, sometimes physical, though no hands were laid on me so it was difficult to identify. But it was clear that I couldn't continue this way. So... What happened is I got to the point in my mental state that I thought the only way out, since I couldn't leave my marriage, was to take my own life. It seemed like a pretty severe solution to a problem. Thankfully, God loudly reminded me that that was not the answer. Um, he had a better plan for my life if I could only hold on. The courage it took to leave almost tore me apart, but I did hold on. I had support of other people, and that helped. But I had God on my right hand, and that was the best help. I had no dreams of remarrying or dating or being involved with anybody emotionally ever again. I was not going to put myself in that position to be taken advantage of or to be abused or to be vulnerable at all. So I thought I'd be alone for the rest of my life. But God had other plans, which were a lot better than mine. So how do we recognize that we're growing in our grief journey? You may have circumstances or moments that you realize that you are changing. So I'm going to tell you about 
One of the moments that we laugh at now, but it wasn't very funny when it happened. Boris and I would meet and go for walks. We wouldn't necessarily even talk. We would just walk in our grief. And I was walking off a lot of anger and hurt, and he was walking off a lot of sadness and hurt. And we were walking in an area that had traffic, and I was walking on the street side. So he just gently put his hands on my shoulders and moved me to the inside so that if a car came by, I would not be in danger. Well, being that I was coming from an abusive situation, I didn't handle myself very well. And I was very vocal in saying that he did not have my permission to put his hands on me or to move me. And that if I wanted to walk in the middle of the street, that I would, <clears throat> that that was my choice and not his to make for me. And in that moment, number one, I was embarrassed that I had treated my friend that way. But number two, I realized that I was starting to find my own voice and that in this grief journey, I was becoming stronger. So it was it was a good wake up call, even though it was a little bit of a severe reaction to a just somebody trying to be nice and not having to be hit by a car. But Yeah, if I didn't weigh two hundred and seventy five pounds, I'd have been frightened. <laughs> he wasn't very scared. He just smiled and brushed it off and Luckily, he understood where I was coming from, so I appreciated his patience with me. So we really have two choices when we're moving forward in our grief. We can stay where we're at and not make any progress at all, or we can move forward. Forgive yourself for what you didn't know. You're not responsible for the actions of other people. Sometimes you get into a relationship, and it starts out this way, and the other person in the relationship, they have the free will to make other decisions and just understand that yeah it's not fun it happens you're only responsible for how you react to someone's choices moving forward feels like letting go of the pain and opening up to a new future and yes it can feel vast and frightening but when you lean on god and not yourself his strength not yours he'll see you through it I think that also goes for people that have lost loved ones at the hands of other people, the victims of a crime or medical malpractice. You didn't put that person in that position. You did the best and trusted people that have been in the past trustworthy. So that's not your burden to bear. So I'm going to go back to the garden analogy here and say that before a flower blooms, it has to be buried in the ground. As it pushes up through the soil, it slowly emerges. So just like a seed, it can feel awkward. It can be slow to grow on the cloudy days. You can be influenced by the winds of change, and you can cling on to the past. It's going to take some time to let the warmth of the sun make you strong enough to bloom. But being patient with your progress is an important attribute to embrace. Patience with myself is definitely something I struggle with. I compare myself to other people. I don't recognize how far I've come in a situation. So I think it's important to have other people in your world that know you, that can point those things out to you, how far they see you've come, because we don't always self-reflect well, especially in grief. Like any growth, it won't be linear. Sometimes the path is straight and you feel confident in your walk. There's no rocks, roots, uh, loose dirt or mud. Other times it's crooked and filled with large boulders you need to climb. We know from experience on a hike at Mount Rainier that that can be a daunting task. Uh, Working to grow past the devastation takes time. It takes a lot of time. I'll qualify that by saying it takes a lot of time, but once you're there, it doesn't seem like it was a lot of time. So how long do you think it took you to get from complete devastation to being able to function Complete devastation to function about a year, complete devastation to, hey, look, the world still exists around me about 18 months. Working to grow past the devastation takes time, but keep putting your feet in front of each other. Feeling loss is not a weakness. It shows that you have a soul, and it's your soul that's regrowing in a new light. Once grief is planted, it never disappears. It'll become a part of who you are. The result of losing someone can change how we see life around us. For us, we've learned not to take anything for granted. Every day we see it as a precious blessing and something to be appreciated, even if it's just a sunset or time together, laughter with a friend. I think it changes the viewpoint in your life. Grief comes in many forms and sizes. Please do not compare yourself to anyone else. Be open to hearing what others want to share, but don't expect your journey to look or sound like theirs. 
Natasha and I had very different circumstances leading to our losses, but we share similar feelings about them. Learn from each other and apply it the way it makes sense to you. It's your garden to plant and tend. Thank you for listening, and we hope that it helps you navigate your grief journey. Please share it, and if you feel like you want to, subscribe to our channel. It helps us get the word out to more people. Please leave a comment. We love reading what you have to say. You all mean so much to us. and We hope you'll continue with us on this journey and just know that our thoughts and prayers are with all of you. Join us next week when we'll talk about triggers and how to handle them. I am Boris. I am Natasha. And, and we're we stronger, stronger together. together.